testifying on, on cybersecurity. But what makes me really nervous is like standing in front of my peers trying to talk to you guys about stuff we already know about. So forgive me if my voice is a little, is a little shaky. Um, I guess let's start off with an, an icebreaker here. Right, so I made this joke last week for my four-year-old son, and I want to try it out on you guys. We were seeing Zootopia. So, what do you call a sheep that's a cop? Anyone? A sheep that's a cop. A police officer. <laughs> Did that work? I mean, it works for my four-year-old. So. <laughs> Uh, so I'm Justin Harvey. I've been doing cybersecurity for 22 years. I got started in 1994 when I worked for the first uh, national ISP. Any of you remember a company called Netcom? Anyone? Anyone? There you go. Old, uh, old ISP. They get, gave out Unix uh, shell accounts back in CentOS 413 days, and they had a, like a little slip PPP product they had for Windows. And... Uh, one day, this Japanese guy came in and said, you guys have been owned. And of course, he didn't say owned, because that's like what in the last 10 years that we've figured out what owned or pwned means. And uh, he's like, this guy came in. I've been tracking him. He's been stealing credit cards from you guys. We had to put up uh, one of the first firewalls way before Cisco even had a firewall. This was like 94, Livingston Firewall, if you guys remember the, the Livingston company. Well, that guy turned out to be Sutomo Shimamura. The guy who hacked our company was Kevin Mitnick, so that's really how and why I get in, got into security. And since then, I've worked big breaches like uh, Sony in 2011. My team was on the ground there at Sony PlayStation uh, um, day one. Uh, I've done incident response in mainland China. I'm probably the only American ever to have set a uh, foot on China doing actual incident response, so I was out there for a couple months. And so what I want to talk to you today about is uh, the Apple versus DOJ case. And it just seems like every day we hear uh, new stuff uh, happening and kind of how it affects us in the commercial world. Um, so in, in the ordering of events, uh, you know, first off, I did say that I, a lot of this is, is my opinion. So it's not, the, it's not necessarily shared by the company Fidelis. Uh, we make... Uh, Network analytic uh, security products, and we have, a, have an endpoint product that does detection response on the, on the endpoint, and we have a consulting uh, team that responds to breaches. So the first thing here, does my laser work? Cool. Um, the, the thing to, to not ever lose sight of is, number one, 14 people died, and a lot of people were injured. So my heart, and I think all of our hearts, go out to the victims of this senseless uh, domestic crime. Uh, and this guy and his wife murdered all of these people, and he had a, a, a work uh, iPhone. In January of 2016, the FBI requested the iCloud uh, password to be changed. Uh, and this is really what created, what started the big hoopla. So just an informal poll, just an informal poll. Who here is an Apple user? Or I, iPhone, wow, geez. Well, I'd say, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's like 80%, 85%, maybe 86.5%. And, um, and when, you, when you change your iCloud password, you gotta do it in two places, right? You gotta, if you do it on the web. You gotta change it on the web, and then you gotta go to your device and change it uh, on your phone. And when you change your iCloud password in this manner, meaning uh, on the web, or Apple did it, it created this problem so that, it, that uh, Saeed Farouk's iPhone couldn't have been backed up, right? Because when you, it will automatically back up to the cloud by default if you have a power source and you're connected to a trusted Wi-Fi. So if, if the FBI had not requested that of Apple, we probably still could have plugged in his phone. They could have taken it to the, um, what was, uh, Saeed Farouk's employer was San Bernardino County of Mental Health, right? It was the health department. So they, the FBI could have just taken in his phone and plugged it in. And it was an older phone. It was a 5C, so there was no fingerprint. So you couldn't take his corpse <laughs> and put his, his thumb on the, the, uh, on the unlock, because it was an older phone. The 5C doesn't have it. So they created this problem. 
and they realized that the last iCloud backup was six weeks old, so before the attack. So six weeks ago, he backed up. He must have been in the office, it backed up, and then nothing happened between then. So the FBI naturally wants, and I believe they are correct in their investigation procedures, they need to unlock that phone and see that six-week period. Um, I Part of my role at Fidelis is also to work with the media, which I do about 90% of the time, and I... I we all know this. I think, I, I hope all of you know this, but the media kept asking me, like I got it received a, uh, a inquiry three weeks ago from Politico. They're like, what does the FBI hope to gain in that six week period? I'm like, duh. I mean, uh, you never know who he's, who he's texting, who he's iMessaging, who he's doing any of this to. And Politico came back with, well, what about the carrier logs? What about, uh, he was probably with Verizon, Sprint, or AT&T, right? For the most part. Um, what about their carry logs? Because they collect metadata. They collect who you're calling. They collect SMS numbers. They don't know the content per se. Maybe they do because SMS is not encrypted. Or maybe Apple could have said that the iMessage recipient was this email address or this, or this phone number. But they want to see the content. They just don't want to see the, the metadata around the transaction. They also want to see if uh, Saeed was downloading something like Skype or WhatsApp, something that, that the carrier really wouldn't have visibility into in, in that respect. So I believe they had, this is an absolute legitimate request. Uh, Comey told the Senate in, on February 9th, uh, we're still trying to unlock it, uh, and they started to go to Apple and ask them for help. Also in February, uh, a couple more things happened. Uh, once it became public that the FBI requested Apple unlock it, um, the, there was a big public outcry of, just do this one phone, just unlock this and the government will go away, right? It's just a terrorism case. Well, the fact of the matter is, had Apple unlocked it, the New York District Attorney and the State Attorney had over 175 iPhones ready to go, ready to subpoena Apple and say, use that same tool that you made to unlock it. Uh, and um, I believe the next speakers, uh, Heather and Christopher, uh, great lawyers or attorneys are gonna speak uh, either th in this room or in another room. I highly recommend you go there uh, to, to hear about this, but they're gonna talk about the All Writs Act of 1789, which was an, which is a, really darn old law, 220 or 30 years old, that said uh, the, the government can compel individuals or organizations to comply or assist them in a time of need, in an investigation or a situation. So without that, the, the government had no right and no legal ability to ask Apple, perform some development. Now, it's one thing to, to subpoena a vendor and say, push this button. We know you have the capability today. Unlock this phone, or uh, change this password, for instance. That's easy. Or hand over documents that you have. It is not easy to say, develop. Sit down with your developers and spend your own resources to develop what I deem to be a weapon. And I'll get more to that. And then hours before the scheduled court appearance uh, this last Monday, uh, it was this last Monday, right? The 30th, or was it? Do I have the date wrong? The 21st. It was Monday, right? So um, hours before the scheduled court appearance, uh, FBI postpones the hearing. And then this Monday, the same day that Apple released 9.3, they said they dropped the case. So uh, I'm going to cheat a little here and look at my next slide. Okay, sorry. This is, this is another reason that makes me nervous is like I can belt out and talk for probably two freaking hours on my normal routine. If you want to hear about incident response and all this stuff of, of what we're seeing and how to combat advanced threat defense, but this is, makes me nervous because it's content I don't normally do. Um, so I'm a little bit shooting from the hip. Um, but to analyze a few of these things, uh, I want to, if there's a little bit of advice I want to give you today to use this as, a, as, as an example, um, if anyone has an iPhone today and you're not using multi-factor authentication, I highly recommend it. And if you're, and as well, if you are backing up to the iCloud for convenience, I recommend not doing that as well. Um, and I'll tell you, I'll show you why. Uh, so this exact thing, the FBI requests the iCloud password 
when you are in possession of someone's iCloud password and they back up to the cloud, which is both default, okay, not having their password, but clear text password or just a normal password, not using multi-factor authentication, which Apple supports, you can do things like this. And this is exactly what the FBI did. There is a Python script called iLoot. And when you run iLoot, you supply a, an iCloud username and password and it goes out and programmatically uses a, uh, iCloud's API to uh, act as you, and it lists all of the devices that you have. This is not me, by the way, so don't think that I own a 3GS. Um, you select the device, and then it goes out, and normally when you, I didn't think this was possible, but I kind of understand how, how they do this. Um, what they do is they impersonate you, they gr and, the, and Apple gives you the ability to, um, any programmers in the, in the room? Who's a programmer? There, one dude? Come on, there's got to be some other people out there. All right, two. Um, in programming, there's, uh, there's a function called seek, and seek says go to this part of the file. So if you've got a, an 8 gig file and you know that something is in the middle, you can say seek to the middle of the file. So what Apple does is they give you the capability to seek to certain parts of your huge backup. I mean, if you've got a 128 gig phone and you're uploading photos and all this stuff, your backup is pretty huge. So what they're able to do, uh, this script can do, is say, um, go select which phone you have and then you can download someone's address book, SMS, and photos. And it's worrisome for us as consumers not using multi-factor because if we used multi-factor, whoever had your password wouldn't be able to do this because they wouldn't have the capability to put in the code. It's also worrisome uh, uh, to an extent that, um, and I should have told you this in the beginning, um, I'm a bit of a tinfoil hat wearer, but uh, I, I think um, I think it's justified given a lot of the stuff, and I'll, I'll go over why I think some of this is uh, warranted. But the reason why um, this is, is doable is because, A, people are backing up to the cloud, and B, they're not using multi-factor authentication. And C, I think this creates a condition where combined with the Apple's refusal, and I'm going to tacitly say this, Google and other providers have stood behind Apple, said, you know, we're not going to unlock devices, but I hope we can trust them, Google and Microsoft and those guys. That if vendors won't unlock phones, and if the encryption, uh, and, and if they don't outlaw strong encryption, which I'll get to, then it creates a condition where the government, in order to um, in order to run drug cases, anti-terror cases, or whatever, are going to start developing malware to attack citizens and essentially grab their passwords and do things like this. If they can't get your SMS or criminal or suspected criminal's text history, they're going to figure out a way to do it. And you think I'm a tinfoil hat wearer? Well, go Google a company called The Hacking Team. The Hacking Team was a, a Italy Italian-based um, firm that did for-profit hacking. They developed malware for nation states. They themselves got hacked <laughs> by an Eastern European crime syndicate, and all of their malware got released. But they also released purchase orders. And guess who was guess who two of those entities that were purchasing malware were? Department of Justice, Federal Bureau of Investigation, and uh, the NSA. Why were they doing that? Well, the FBI, according to the press, says they were doing it because their other malware, as a backup to their other malware. And I'm like, why is this not front page news? Why is this not? Great. So anyway, um, do we have a right to privacy? I hope there are no lawyers in the room because I'm going to use a slash dot slash Reddit term. I-A-N-A-L. What does that stand for? I am not a lawyer. Thank you. There's some geeks in here. Um, personal statement. I believe that, the, that it is an inalienable human right to have a private conversation, both digitally and in the real world. Unfortunately, our current... current Unfortunately, our Constitution doesn't specifically allow for that. This is the, uh, the amendment to the Constitution, the fourth, that says that we can be secure in our person's house, papers, and, and effects. Now, uh, this is several hundred years old doy, right? But, uh, so it doesn't say digital communication. It says uh, papers and effects. Uh, so that is, leaves a little bit 
there against unreasonable searches and seizures, and I'll come back to that in a sec. And this is broadly being interpreted uh, two different ways. The first is the one that I support, which is humans have a fundamental right to privacy. And the second one is what is um, being taken by the government. Spying is allowed when there's a probable cause and judiciary oversight. The check and balance to this is through the legislative branch. But this guy changed it all. Now, a personal statement here. Number one, I don't agree with what he did. The method. Uh, I, uh, it, it, in your little homework thing, right? I'm giving you guys homework. Go out and watch the movie Citizen Four. Very good. Anyone seen Citizen Four? Not enough of you. One, five people, six, seven, come on. Please, I implore you, watch the movie Citizen Four because it, start, it shows you from start to finish um, the release of the top secret uh, files of, uh, of Snowden. It's an actual factual account. So it shows the camera starts rolling. Well, first off, I, I'm not going to spoil it. We all know what happens at the end. But um, essentially, it shows you the buildup, all of the congressional testimony, people uh, like the NSA director saying, we're not in front of Congress. We're not collecting metadata. We're not doing mass surveillance. We're not doing all of these things. Then you go to Snowden. He flies to Hong Kong. He gives all the, doc the top secret documents to Glenn Greenwald of The Guardian, shows all the Guardian guys, uh, my friend Julian Borger at The Guardian, who's in possession of all those. But the point is, he, he, he promised, he made an oath, he swore to uphold the Constitution and to keep things secret. And so he broke his word. And it's, it's this situation where he did something really horrible, but he also exposed something horrible as well. So it's like, in my mind, I'm compartmentalizing this. I'm saying, yeah, the guy sucks and he shouldn't have done this, but what he did disclose cannot be ignored, right? Um, I guess one more footnote, footnote on this. It's, there can be arguments made on both sides on whether or not people's lives were at, at risk. I think that um, um, one way to look at it would have been if he, it would have been maybe justifiable if people would have been dying because of this. Americans, like what if it was to expose murders or torture or something like that. But on the other hand, um, what he did also probably could have put soldiers' lives in danger. But then again, there's also the drone strikes that he was, uh, he was um, talking about, uh, how it was authorized and so on. So, but what he changed was, I think before Snowden, I, I was very much a trusting government. There have been, there've been two, uh, trusting government person. There's been two things in my life that have really just resonated with me and that changed my view. The first is the, uh, is the Iraq war when we didn't find weapons of mass destruction. That made me really mad. And the second thing was when the government, the NSA, was testifying and said, we are not doing these things. And then they were. And it wasn't just, uh, it wasn't just, yeah, we're collecting metadata to find threats. It was, we're collecting metadata to find threats. And did you know about all of these abuses? People like NSA coworkers were spying on their spouses or spouse, spying on their neighbors and pulling their phone records and looking at their messages and their texts and, and, I know I'm going to bungle this, but the uh, the the quote that I love is um, uh, it's by um, uh, uh, the Baron Anton from England. It was it goes something like this: you know, power uh, power corrupts, but absolute power corrupts absolutely, right? And that is, yeah, as politicians and as governments get bigger, you can't trust them, but you have to compartmentalize what what they have access to. But the more and more they have access to. And, and, and in, in, a sense, in, in essence, the government or the NSA had all of this power, there were quite a few abuses. So he changed a lot of our perceptions, because I'm not sure that I would have really had a problem with Apple unlocking that phone. I've been like, ah, people are jailbreaking, all this stuff is happening, so how about you do that? And I'm cheating here, okay. Um, the, 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 the things that I would say is, I, my personal opinion is, Apple did the right thing. I think they did the right thing because it's not that I didn't believe that the San Bernardino, Bernardino attackers uh, 
didn't deserve the truth or what could be in those six weeks. I felt like Apple would be developing a weapon. They would be developing a weapon because if they were to develop that code to unlock any phone, then what happens to that code? It can then be subpoenaed by the government. It can be, then be taken by the government or they could give it to the government. And then you've essentially created this weapon that is in two hands. It's in Apple's hands and it's in the, the government's hands. And, and even at this point, I'd still kind of be like, okay, I, I'm kind of with you. But then when you see things like OPM or the Joint Chiefs uh, emails being fished and secrets going out the door, if we can't keep our own top secret files top secret, instead of getting in nation states hands, what possible hope could we have for not letting this thing escape? Because if it is escapes, there will be lives in our commerce and our livelihood in danger because there's already documented cases where executives will go to another nation state to negotiate a merger or an acquisition to do a business deal and the Chinese will grab their phones and laptops in customs and they'll take them into a back room and then they'll come out. Well, what happened? Well, they were probably imaging it. And shame on anyone who goes to a different country and doesn't use a burned laptop or, a, or heavily encrypted uh, devices. Uh, small personal plug here, if you type in Fidelis, welcome to the jungle, I do a whole webinar uh, on this. It talks about operational security. There's cases of executives going over to, um, that wasn't homework, that would be really self-serving, but uh, if you want to. Um, uh, looking at time here. Uh, there's cases of executives going to other countries and their, their hotel rooms were bugged. My hotel room was bugged uh, when I was working the breach for, for two months in Shenzhen, China. Uh, the phones were bugged. So there's, if this is out, and of course every nation state on earth would want this, um, here is a piece of homework. Go out and rent a movie uh, called uh, Sneakers. And Sneakers uh, is a, a, a film with Robert Redford and Ben Kingsley. And I'll boil it down for you. Essentially, Ben Kingsley invents this magical box that can decrypt anything, right? He, they, plug it into, they plug this modem and they dial the DOJ and they can see everything. They dial the FAA and they can see, kind of looks like the makers go, and then there's all the planes flying around. River Phoenix was in there too. Um, uh, and the, the quote that I love in there, there's two quotes, and that is number one, uh, no government on earth would, or every government on earth would kill for this capability. And that box that he made is the same as that unlocking iPhone, if Apple were to have developed that. The second thing is that uh, the, the Ben Kingsley quote, maybe it's a Robert Redford quote, I think it's Ben Kingsley, said, um, the battlefield today, or the way that, that nation states are, are winning battles, it's with zeros and ones. It's not with a gun anymore. So we have to really make sure that there are no back doors in whatever we do because we can't trust. It's just, it's like a mathematical fact. We can't trust that whatever back door, whatever we create, will not fall into enemy hands. And we, there's a long precedence of this. Uh, let's l just look at the, the, past few breaches, Target and Home Depot and OPM and Sony and all of the, these big companies, they spend tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars and they still get hit. They still get hit by that one guy or gal who clicks on the FedEx reroute package <laughs> phishing email and then they're in, right? Um, and this has created this sort of juxtaposition between spying for legitimate, to, to find a threat, and spying on, on the citizens is really a, a macro version of what I feel like we're struggling with in, in the industry. Uh, full disclosure, I work for a, a services and product company, and we make uh, products that do surveillance on the network. But then again, so does FireEye, and so does Palo Alto, and so does Cisco, and so do all the biggies. So I'm not saying it, we're unique. I'm saying that as vendors, we're running, we are in a, in a pickle right now. Um, 
if my PR team were here, they'd kick my butt. If I, if I, if I'm going to open this up a little bit, they'd kick my butt because there was a um, case. We're currently going through some of this right now uh, in California. Um, uh, the University of California went through a bunch of breaches with nation states, and. Um, th Berkeley, who's, do you guys know who the University of California uh, Chancellor is? Trivia question? Anyone? Janet Napolitano. So she, she understands how serious it can be when, uh, when information gets out. And universities are a treasure trove for nation states because of things like healthcare information and stats and research. So why should a nation state develop their own capabilities and their own uh, people um, to perform research when they can just get it from these universities. So the University of California last year had a big breach. It was public. They brought us in, and we were collecting network metadata on threats, looking. We weren't decrypting anything. We weren't doing all of these things that the government is doing, but we were still caught up in a student backlash saying, you guys are conducting surveillance. You guys, meaning University of California, President, Office of the President. and. And so it's kind of an ongoing thing. We're not, we're not at fault. We're not really, we're peripherally involved because we're brought in to find nation state threats. We're not, we weren't being brought in for that. But um, it's, a, it's a really fine line I think we're running in corporations today. And I think this, as information security professionals, it's up to us to do a lot of education. I guess I should have put, put that message at the beginning. It's up to us to, whether or not you agree with me on any or all of these subjects, it's up to us to educate our family and friends and the press and the government and help to influence it. I don't know about you guys, but it infuriates me to see Congress people talking about key escrow or third key or hoping that they can, well, just tell Silicon Valley to develop some new crap, you know, some new software that'll fix all this. There, it's a, you can't fix math. You also can't fix stupid, but um, but I, I, it just really concerns me that I was going to say surprise, but it it just concerns me that our our legislators don't get it. You know, another piece of homework: go watch uh, if you're if you're okay with obscenities, watch John Oliver's thing on DOJ versus Apple from a couple of weeks ago. It was pretty funny. Um, uh, and I do have a tremendous amount of respect for the senator who said something to the effect of, well, if Apple won't do it or can't do it, they're stupid. And then he came back later on after the, he was educated and actually stood up and, and, and he didn't stand up, but in a, one of his subcommittee meetings, he said, I was wrong. So I don't know. Anyone remember who that guy's name is? Yes. Uh, Republican, right? Yeah. I'm not a Republican, but I respect that guy for his views. And, and be able to come out like a man and say, okay, I was wrong. I mean, that's a lot of fortitude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, so it's up to us as an industry to, to really educate people, and as, this is the executive track, but we're not all executives here, um, and particularly me, I'm just a talking head geek, um, it's up to us to educate, I guess here's one of the things, is to educate the board and the C-suite that it's not just as simple as, as putting devices on, or it's not as simple as, um, uh, supporting or being against an issue. There's a lot more. It's really complicated to be able to, to wade through a lot of this. And I feel like um, the polls are, are swayed in a direction because it's so complicated that the American people are just aren't keeping up with it. Like I looked at a Washington Post uh, poll that was like 63 or 60%, 67% of Americans said that Apple should unlock the phone, but that's because they don't have all of this extra uh, information. Let me cheat a little bit. So what I think, in drawing a parallel between the NSA doing wholesale surveillance on, on the populace and collecting metadata and, and abusing that versus uh, to, in, for, the, for the public um, explanation of finding or monitoring for threats, um, and the and the microcosm of that, which is in our corporations, what's the difference between the NSA spying and us spying? Because we we essentially do that, right? I mean, we put these Palo Alto devices down, 
and these Fidelis devices and these FireEye devices, and it does things and it sends information to our SIM, right, or to our log management or to our dashboards, and we look and we can see where people are browsing. The I don't have any any glib answers for you, but what I will say is, I personally think it comes down to communicating what is going on to your employees, and it comes down to, and, and I haven't seen this very, very often. Uh, when you join a company you sign, or you go to school, you sign all these documents, and we don't read half of them, but, um, well, I, I don't. Um, the, the fine print, it's like those apps that have all these big terms of, of, uh, terms of agreement, like, I don't read that stuff. But it, it's critical to be transparent and, com and clearly communicate to the employees that if you are on the corporate network, then you will be subject to um, to surveillance. And surveillance is a dirty word. It's the S word, right? I don't know. If, I'm not politically correct, but if I were the CISO, I'd probably say something like monitoring for threats versus surveillance. But let's call a spade a spade. Um, acceptable use policies and really clearly define the usage of personal versus corporate assets and think through the, the, the mess that the San Bernardino County, uh, Health Can uh, San Bernardino County Health Department must be going through with a lot of this. I mean, it was their device that he had and that, that is embroiled in all of this. And maybe it sheds a new light on BYOD. As an old school security guy, I hate BOD, a BYOD. But I know, I know it's necessary. Um, but, but, you know, my, my two cents is don't ever allow Un, um, un MDM'd personal devices, but that also inter interjects some problems. MDM, uh, mobile device management. There's a couple of them, like Iron Watch and Mobile Iron, and we're, we're creating this quagmire by doing bio BYOD. Because on one hand, the lazy way, I shouldn't have said that because someone's probably doing that in this room and hates me. The in the 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 less the more risky way is to do BYOD, where you sign a document and say, "Okay, uh, now Justin can bring his iPad to work and use it to do work. He can use Outlook and he can join the protected Wi-Fi, right?" Without doing anything, that's really the the most risky way because then you have to trust that whoever brings their iPad or their Fire tablet or their laptop that it is properly secured. They're not doing some crazy things like, I don't know, it doesn't have, like four-digit passcodes with no 10 attempt wipe, things like that. And then, of course, you the the next level or the, the top level to that is BYOD, but you got to sign something, and we're going to install Iron, Iron, I almost said Iron Watch, Mobile Iron and Air Watch so that you as a company can monitor that device. But then... That, I think, we're going to start seeing more legal cases of companies abusing that. And it's your personal device, and those MDMs can be really sneaky. They can record all the URLs that you go to. So what if you're an employee, you love your iPad, you want to use it in meetings because everyone schedules meetings, and you're in there and you can play Angry Birds while people are talking, and you, you, have, your little, you have your little innocuous mobile iron icon there, and... Mobile Iron's great because it can do things like the IT administrator can provision your email account just like that onto your device. You don't even have to know the Exchange server or any of that stuff. But what if you go home and you browse um, some pornography and you're into certain things and you're going to those sites? Well, what happens when the administrator looks at your browser history or looks at some of that information and exposes it or the company uses it against you, maybe for, that you have an illness. There, this sort of juxtaposition, I think, I'm just waiting on this to happen. And when it hits the courts, it's going to be really a difficult case to try because it's a personal device in the personal house, but you've got your MDM on there. And, um, and forget the US for a sec. Did you guys know in Europe that uh, you have to get special privileges to do incident response on an endpoint. Like you have to, there's a little asterisk here. All companies, all countries are different, right? But the, 
the the strict ones like Germany and Luxembourg, um, Brussels, boy, they will kick your butt if you're an incident responder. And you can't even really do uh, threat scanning on these endpoints. You, you really have to get the employee's permission to do something proactive. If the stuff does hit the fan, you can do IR, but it's a lot, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot more employee privacy rights. Um, and uh, by the way, am I, am I just speaking to an empty audience? Anyone do international business? Anyone? A couple people? Good. All right. There's a few. Um, there's this thing called the GDPR, and I think the U.S. should have this too. GDPR stands for General Data Protection Regulation. It's this new European Union thing that says um, companies have to tell, they have to inform the public on what they collect, what is considered private, how they can use it, how they can analyze it, and then all of the citizens of Europe have the right to be forgotten. So they can say, Google, forget about me and Google will erase you from, from search histories. It, there's a little bit of a crappiness with the media and going back and forth because you, you could essentially use it to abuse it to take out search results where you're less in favor in news, but that's a different subject. And uh, you know that the US doesn't have any of those laws. We don't, we don't have any laws that characterize what is considered private data. Uh, I, I testified in front of the Senate on uh, data brokers in November, and these big data brokers like Axiom and Experian and all these others, we have no idea what they have on us. They they have, what's the next level up from terabytes? Petabyte. What's the next level up from that? That's what? A shit ton of data. All right. <laughs> Let's just say they have a massive amount of data on all of us, things that we didn't even know was possible. They, that's really big data, right? When we call our, you know, like our five terabyte Splunk cluster, cl cluster um, big data, yeah, they operate on a totally different scale. And so does Google and Facebook, and I kind of feel like the EU is way ahead of, uh, of us here in the States because they actually classify what is, what is um, personal data. But what is... Um, What's really going to be funny is, do you guys know this term Brexit? Who knows what Brexit means? What's it mean? Exactly. So if you're doing very smart, check out the big brain on Brad. Uh, Pulp Fiction, right? Okay, just making sure. Um, uh, if Britain leaves the EU, that's going to leave all of this in a disarray uh, for the United Kingdom. So if you're doing business over there, good luck. Uh, it's going to be an interesting uh, case. Uh, I have no idea what I meant by Romanian case involving Yahoo Messenger. Um, let me think here. There was a, um, I think it was the law, uh, this guy, oh, I remember, this uh, Romanian guy was using uh, Instant Messenger at the office, and they were legally able to spy on him. It was against company policy to use the Instant, instant Messenger, and... So the company uh, spied on him and saw him using it, and he sued, saying, you don't have the right to, uh, to spy on me, even though I was breaking the acceptable use policy, and he actually lost. So that's actually an interesting victory. But, um, you know, I guess to, to bring it around uh, to, to the topic at hand, which was privacy in today's enterprise, I guess hopefully you guys are walking away a little more knowledgeable, but also... I hope that you you guys are able to understand it's it's never as simple as we're going to keep your private data private. It's with all this BYOD, with all of these devices, with all of this um, uh, monitoring for threats and network gear, that there's quite a room for abuse, and not only at the corporate level, but at the at the macro level, at the at the government level, and we're seeing that today uh, with the FBI and DOJ. So with that. Um, open discussion, tell me what you guys think, you disagree with me, it's something completely orthogonal or different, tell me any questions or um, anyone want to make a statement? <laughs> We're not on the right, yes sir. Oh yes, thank you, thank you. Where I was going with this is 
I don't ever want to hear the word key escrow or third party key ever, because as soon as you have that capability, you guys know what I mean by that, right? You, person A is talking to person B. I'm talking to my coworker. See that big tall guy back there? That's Mike Sherman. He runs our central division here at the company. Um, if I'm having a private conversation with Mike, it's he gives me his key, I give him my key. We're having a conversation. Two keys. The third key would be giving the, you the government, so I have to create a third key to give to you, so at any time in the past, you can go back and look at our third key. And that's called key escrow or third key. And the problem with this, and the government tried to do this in the 90s, trivia question, what was it called? The clipper chip. Yeah, I like it when Clapper talks about the clipper chip. That's funny. Admiral Clapper, um, what has he had? Clapper. That's head of... Uh, uh, intelligence, dis right? Which, which one? Yeah. So, uh, DIA, yeah. Um, DNI. And the problem with this is that the, you have to trust the government that they won't abuse that third key. And currently Congress, and hell, Feinstein said that she was going to introduce this bill if no one else did. This would just simply weaken our 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 security. And it would weaken it because just like the weaponization of the iPhone backdoor, if anyone were to get a hold of these third-party keys, that would essentially mean they could, it's like that box from sneakers. They could plug in the box and see any encrypted traffic. They could see iMessages. They could see all this stuff. So let's play it out. Suppose Feinstein gets her way and, and they're able to ramrod this in through uh, Congress to say, all the major manufacturers, let's start there. All the major manufacturers, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, anyone who makes a device has to do um, key escrow. So, and, and by the way, I'm going to say this in a smart-ass manner, if they do it in the way that they got the, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act through at the end of the year, which was kind of dirty, they put it into a big appropriations bill at the end of the year, and then it just slid through, even though a lot of us were lobbying against it. Um, don't get me started on information security sharing. Um, so if they get it through, then the biggies will have to comply, right? Microsoft and Apple and all these people will comply, and they'll start to give the government their third-party keys. You can kind of monitor and audit that. But what will happen is the terrorists, the criminals, us cybersecurity professionals, we're not going to use iMessage anymore. What are we going to use? No, not carrier pigeons. Uh, you're right. We're going we're gonna to use a third-party app. We're going to use WhatsApp and Skype and... Snapchat? I hate Snapchat. I, my daughter uses it, and I have a big problem. I use it, too, but I, I hate when things just disappear. You know why the kids use Snapchat? Because those pictures disappear. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go one level down. We're going to go to third-party apps. And let's say Congress comes back again and says, if, as soon as they cross, there's a threshold that they're going to cross. As soon as they outlaw, app, any app developer would be required to give a third party key to the government, I think they're crossing a line. I think they're crossing a line because that will be the first time in US history that a developer could not develop what they wanted. Because right now, in the US, right now, I can sit down and I can program the worst malware in human history. I mean, I'm not saying I have the capability, I probably don't, but let's just say I did. It, it, it could overwhelm a nuclear wreck, or it could crash planes, it could do whatever. As long as I didn't infect anyone with it, I can have it on safely onto my laptop. As long as it didn't have like pictures of something illicit that's illegal. But the minute that Congress says that for the third party key escrow, don't do it, they have introduced two problems. Number one is, it's, it impinges upon my freedom of speech to be able to write whatever I want, whatever code I want, and not have to give any of it to the government. The second thing is, it's unenforceable. Because they can't... What is the way that the government would audit this? If they wanted to ensure everyone was in compliance? Yes, right. And what do you got to do to the carrier? Plug some stuff into the network, right? You essentially got to go, go do surveil mass surveillance again under the purposes of auditing the people that are in compliance. So uh, those are my, that's my things about the, the th and, and plus it's mathematically, there's no mathematical model that will support building a backdoor. There's just not. The problem is the government has that, has that backdoor. There was one dude who posted an encryption algorithm that said, 
in order to decrypt something, person A and person B could, could communicate, but in order to decrypt that communication, there wasn't a third party key. There was like a third party key that was built up into six shards and six people had to come together in order to decrypt that traffic. Well, then you're just sitting there fishing and, and going to every nation state or every person who has that shard and assembling it together, right? So, uh, we're almost out of time here. Uh, any other questions or comments? Uh, I guess I'm lying on the open discussion thing, but questions, comments, concerns, flames, constructive criticism. Okay. I'm ending with 30 seconds to go. Thank you guys so much for laughing at my jokes. I appreciate it. Thank you.